you. Uh, but I, I want to open our hearts to know how to compassionately come alongside people that are struggling and caught up in this web of, of deception that they're walking in. Compassion and conviction, grace and truth must stay connected. Jesus demonstrated that for us in, in how he related to people in his time and how he has responded to each one of us as well. Homosexual and transgender issues are front and center. If you are alive and breathing, you know that. Uh, it's, it's everywhere. Every, it's, it's in the media. It's, it's in the movies. It's, it's, it's in our schools. It's in our communities. Everybody is talking about it in one way or another. It, it, our congregants, especially our children and youth, are, are being indoctrinated to think gender is a choice. I mean, that's, they're trying to normalize that narrative in our culture. And it is impacting our youth and our children and our churches. And as leaders, we just need to realize that uh, we need to stay alert and know how to respond to that uh, with grace and truth. The media is constantly bombarding us to normalize this. There's intense culture, cultural and political pressure to try to force this narrative on us. I believe personally that it is the spearhead of persecution on the church in America. And I believe, and you, you know, it's increasing. And I believe that's uh, the plan of the enemy. I think we might be surprised as leaders, as pastors, how many of our people are wavering or struggling on this issue. Not because we're not teaching the truth, but because of the pressure at school the pressure they're getting at work, the pressure from family members, from the government, from the media, and even pressure from Christian teachers. It's a lot for our people to be dealing with. We live in a time when anyone who dares to speak about Christian values publicly is either canceled or attacked and criticized. Some schools are secretly indoctrinating our children in gender ideology and making them question their gender, telling them sometimes the doctors make a mistake when assigning their gender at birth and they can choose to change their gender. That is a common teaching in many of our schools. Some schools are secretly hiding children's gender transitioning from their parents. Some parents are losing custody of their children for not allowing them to transition. We've heard about that in Canada. That's happening in the United States. Teachers and workers are getting fired for not affirming gender ideology. But there are also some very good signs. There's hope in the midst of all of this. Parents are beginning to stand up get involved and beginning to push back. Uh, over 20 states, over 20 states in our country right now are either stopping or limiting gender transitioning treatments. England, Sweden, Finland, and some other countries are now backtracking and putting their brakes on so-called gender affirming care. There is hope. Uh, there's, this is not a depressing discussion. But it is a discussion that we need to get engaged in if we're going to make a difference. So I say all of this uh, to simply emphasize that the people sitting in our pews are under tremendous pressure. Our children going to school are under tremendous pressure. I've discovered that pastors and churches often find it difficult tackling this subject. They're not sure... What to say is, you know, they know they're going to get a lot of pushback. It's controversial in some places. Maybe we, as pastors, we make a statement here and there. We quote some scripture, and we hope that that settles it. But for a lot of our people, the questions and the things they're struggling with go a lot deeper than just quoting some scripture. 
They're, they're trying to understand how to deal with some of the training that is required at work. They're, they're, they're dealing with all kinds of issues surrounding this. On top of this, they're encountering people who claim to be Christians who are twisting the scripture to make it sound like God approves. We need to help our people think biblically and know how to respond to the deception and the pressure in a compassionate way. I believe we need to be prepared for these broken people to come flooding into our churches as they realize they have been fed a lie that has destroyed their lives. Many are beginning to detransition, and uh, they are the harvest. We talk about the harvest, reaching the lost. This is the lost, this is the harvest, and they're coming. They're, they're looking for a place for, to put their lives back together. Much like the church struggled to know how to respond to the long-haired, barefoot hippies in the Jesus movement. The church today needs to learn how to receive the sexually broken who want to put their lives back together. As they come into our churches, what are we going to do? Do we know how to talk to them? Do we know how to help them? Do we know how to be compassionate in the journey that they're on? God intends his church, his people, to be a safe place for the struggler to come and find refuge, to find love, to find healing. And I believe God wants to teach us how to be grace-filled in our response. As a pastor, I've had parents come to me that broken because their child has just announced to them that they are gay. And some of the children try to convince their parents that, look, I'm a Christian, I love Jesus, and he approves of what I'm doing. And to and this has happened, and to prove their point, they give them literature for some, some of these revisionist Christians that redefine the scriptures to, to make it look as if God approves of their gay identity, their gay behavior. Parents get confused. They're torn by their desire to love their child and yet hold on to their convictions. And on top of that, I've seen parents in my extended family crumble under this pressure because sometimes the children will say, Mom and Dad, if you really love me, you will approve of my choice. And the parents struggle with that blackmail of, 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 of their love. This burden of working with parents and just seeing the struggle that's going on stirred me to write the book, uh, to address some of the deceptions, highlight some of the biblical truth, and yet find a compassionate way to respond that is true to our convictions, that is true to our scripture. So the book is available on Amazon. And for this conference, it's usually $9.99, about $10 on Amazon. I put it down to $7 for the next three days because I really want to give you some tools, a tool to help you uh, because sometimes you can just give it to a, a parent or someone that's struggling in this area. Today, a person's feelings trump science, reality, and truth. But it's the truth that sets people free. So what's our starting point here this morning? My starting point is this. We need to approach sexual brokenness scripturally, compassionately, and with humility. We, we start by recognize that we're all beautiful. We're all made in God's likeness and image. But also we're all broken. And we're broken in different ways. But we're all broken. We, li we live in a fallen world. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11. Let me read this. Don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin or homosexuality or are thieves or greedy people or drunkards or are abusive or cheat people, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. Some of you were once like that, 
but you were cleansed, you were made holy, you were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Now, sin has varying degrees of consequence and impact on our lives, on our relationship, on our society. But Paul, in this passage, does not rank them as one being more sinful than another. I think we can all find ourselves in this list because we're all broken. Sadly, sexual immorality, such as lust and pornography, are all too common among us, among the church today. But just as we do not normalize any of these sins in this passage, so we must not normalize homosexuality or transgenderism, which our culture is pressuring us to do. We must not look down on those struggling with homosexuality or transgender confusion. We all have our own battle that we're working to overcome. So let's look first at homosexuality and then we'll we'll look at transgenderism. Homosexuality is also called same-sex attraction. In fact, that is the preferred term for those that are struggling with this. Everywhere homosexual behavior and lust is mentioned in the Bible, it is condemned. So I start with that. Every place in the Bible where it addresses this issue, it's in the negative sense. It's condemned. The reading of scripture shows clearly that same-sex sexual behavior and lust is morally wrong and sinful in God's sight. The scripture also makes it clear that it is sinful to not only engage in same-sex sexual behavior, but also to approve and affirm those who do. Romans 1.32, they not only continue to do these very things, but they also approve of those who practice them. There are six main scripture passages that guide us on this discussion. And for the sake of time, I'm only going to refer to them. I might read some of them. uh, But I I want to refer to some of the arguments that you're going to hear from the revisionists that are trying to say, well, God approves, or the Bible really doesn't say that or mean that. I just want to give you some tools because you're going to hear this as you move into, into ministering to people that are caught up in this struggle. In my book, I go into a lot more detail uh, about all the different passages here and and the arguments. So the first passage is the Genesis creation passage, where we see the original design for marriage. In Genesis 1, God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said, be fruitful, multiply. And then Genesis 2, it says, But for Adam no suitable helper was found. Then in verse 22, Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man and brought her to the man. Now the revisionist arguments of this passage is that God is neither male nor female. And his creation plan was to provide a suitable helper and a companion for Adam. And they say a same-sex partner can fill that, can be a suitable helper and can be a companion as two different personalities are joined together. Plus, they state, uh, marriage was not just for procreation because not all heterosexual couples are able to have children. Now, the biblical response is God designed biological males and females distinctly different. That's God's design. It was Eve's sexual difference and feminine uniqueness that made her a suitable helper not her personality. God designed them to fit together sexually. Being a suitable helper is not just about love and different personalities being able to bond together. Homosexuality is a deviation and perversion of God's creation design. The male and female relationship in marriage is affirmed throughout scripture by Jesus and others. Sometimes they'll say, well, Jesus didn't address this. Yes, he did. Marriage also has spiritual symbolism important to God. Marriage between a man and a woman represents a relationship between Christ and the church and is sacred. Man marrying man destroys this symbolic spiritual relationship. Marriage 
It's also designed as a huge union in which procreation can happen. Even if some cannot have children, it was still God's design in the covenant of marriage between a male and female. Now, the second passage we find in Leviticus. This is where the moral law is, is written. In Leviticus, Leviticus 18.22, Do not practice homosexuality. Having sex with another man as with a woman is a detestable sin. Now, the revisionist argument is that, well, that's Old Testament. And that was not referring to committed, loving, same-sex relationships. Now, you're going to hear that throughout, that they, one of their arguments is, well, the Bible's not talking about the kind of homosexual relationship that I have. It's not talking about committed sex uh, homosexual relationships. And so that's kind of an argument they, they will usually always throw up. Some say it was referring to cultic prostitution. The argument is also that this Old Testament passage condemning homosexuality includes in the same passage not eating shellfish or wearing mixed fabrics. And so they say if you're going to use this passage to condemn homosexuality then you shouldn't be eating shrimp or wearing mixed fabrics. How can you condemn the one and not the other from that passage? It's a good point. Except the Old Testament includes civil, ceremonial, and moral laws, and they're intertwined in these passages. And we need to understand which is which. Food, for instance, was part of the ceremonial law. Jesus brought an end to the ceremonial law. We are no longer judged by the food we eat or ceremonial day observations such as the Sabbath. Sexual restrictions, however, are part of the moral law and are still for us today. So people need to understand that. It's a false argument. Most of the moral restrictions are repeated in the new covenant. Homosexuality, what we're talking about, is condemned both in the old covenant, in the moral law, and also in the new covenant, the New Testament. Leviticus refers to mutual, consensual sex between two men, and that's what it is condemning. There is no mention of rape, coercion, age difference, or cultic prostitution. In fact, cultic prostitution did not exist at that time in Israel. The third passage is the Genesis 19 passage, where we see the sin and judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah. It's in Genesis 19. Remember, the angels came and visit Lot, and then the men of the city come out and say, let's bring, bring them out that we can have sex with them. It was a, it was a homosexual uh, encounter that they were looking for. Now, the revisionist argument is Sodom and Gomorrah's sin and ensuing judgment was not because of homosexuality. It's not speaking of consensual, monogamous, same-sex, sexual relationship. So they always go back to that. But it says but what it's really talking about there is, is gang rape. The biblical response is it's true that this particular story refers to gang rape, but it's also true Sodom and Gomorrah were truly decadent cities in every way. And in fact, God had decided to bring on judgment on the city before this incident even happened. The scriptures men mention a multitude of their sins, such as not caring for the poor, but it also includes homosexuality, which fed the desire to gang rape, gang rape the angels that visited Lot. In Jude 7, it speaks of the sodomites' pursuit of strange flesh. Their sexual perversion showed the depth of their depravity, which was definitely a part of God's response of judgment and destruction. The next passage is Romans. This is the one that we are probably the most familiar with, the Romans passage, where it talks about unnatural relations and shameful acts. And I'd like to read this. Romans 1, because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. The provision of his argument is, is that Paul was biased. I mean, this was, Paul had a problem. This is Paul's issue. And, and he didn't really understand same-sex attraction and orientation as we do today. 
Uh, so in other words, the Bible's really outdated with the science that we have today. Uh, and also they say he is referring here to lustful and excessive behavior, not committed same-sex relationships. Another common argument in this passage is that Paul was referring to the common practice of pederasty in which older heterosexual men and often wealthy men were having sex with younger boys, which was basically rape. That was a practice in that day. Now the biblical response is this is the most direct and clear passage condemning same-sex sexual behavior. Paul does not say same-sex sexual behavior is wrong because of excessive lust, or, but because it's unnatural or against nature, or against God's original design for us. Nowhere does God make an exception for homosexual behavior based on orientation or committed relationships. It's simply not there. All same-sex behavior is sinful, uh, just as all fornication for single heterosexuals is sinful, and all adultery is sinful, and all lust is sinful. Paul is not referring to pederasty here because he addresses women in same-sex relationships as well, and pederasty was only a male practice. Paul's words are all-inclusive for all same-sex sexual activity, committed or not. The, the next passage is the Corinthians passage, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 10. Now, I already read that passage in my opening. Uh, the, the revisionists would say the Greek words here can also be translated, uh, the Greek word for homosexuality can be translated weakling, wantons, li licentious, and, uh, and can also be referring to economic exploitation by some kind of sexual means. Uh, again, they say it doesn't necessarily mean same-sex sexual behavior. The biblical response is, in this context, it does mean same-sex sexual behavior. In fact, most modern translations render this as homosexual behavior. It seems Paul is condemning both the passive and active forms of a same-sex behavioral relationship. He's, he's speaking to both partners. The Timothy passage in 1 Timothy 1 uh, again, it's talking about the law was made not for the righteous, but the lawbreaker. And then it says for those practicing homosexuality, as, as well as including a number of other uh, uh, sins there as well. And it says, and for whatever is contrary to sound doctrine. Revisionist arguments, they say the passage is not condemning committed same-sex relationships, but sexual exploitation possibly connected to pederasty. But again, this passage clearly condemns sexual immorality, which includes all same-sex sexual behavior. And none of the texts in the Bible say anything about pederasty. So all the passages of, of that you can find in the scripture, again, are clear and strong that same-sex uh, behavior is sin. Same-sex sexual behavior is sin. Uh, one gay author that I, that I wrote uh, said that he admits that, that the Bible was very clear than condemning that. But he says, but we don't use the Bible as our authority. So at least he was honest, you know, in that. Uh, there are a number of contributing factors to same-sex attraction. The American Psychological Association states there's no consensus among scientists about the exact reason that an individual develops a heterosexual bisexual, gay, or lesbian orientation. They all say it's probably a combination of nature and nurture. Now there's three things that I would just say that we do know. We do know that same-sex attraction is not a choice. I'll ex explain that. Same-sex behavior is a choice, and people are not born gay. In other words, there's no gay gene. They haven't found that. Uh, so there's a number of contributing factors. In fact, in my book, I list like 12 contributing factors that sometimes are involved in a, in a person's uh, struggling in this way. <clears throat> so I, I believe it's important to understand the difference between same-sex attraction and same-sex orientation and same-sex behavior. Same-sex attraction is not a choice. The attraction, the, the feeling is not a choice. 
Attractions are not chosen by the person, they're simply felt. Just like as heterosexual attraction is not chosen, I didn't choose it, but it's felt. And it's not always about sexual attraction. Uh, Same-sex attraction is not consciously chosen. They just find themselves attracted more to a person of the same sex than the opposite sex. Most people that are struggling with this do not want to feel this way. Um, And they wish the attraction would go away. Initially, that is what they would say. They often feel guilty and condemned for having the attraction, especially if they're a Christian uh, and they're struggling with this. And let me be real clear. A person is not in sin because they struggle with same-sex attraction. The attraction is not chosen and it's not sin. How we respond to the attraction determines if our behavior becomes sin. If we begin to lust or try to develop a romantic relationship, it then becomes sin. Gay sexual behavior on the other hand, is a choice and is sin. Now, whenever the Bible speaks about homosexuality, it always addresses the behavior, not the attraction. James, in the book of James, it says, all sin begins with desire. When desire has conceived or given into, it then gives birth to sin. So we see a progression there. Uh, The initial desire, the temptation, the attraction toward the same sex is not sin. It's simply part of our brokenness, our fallen nature. Also, it does not mean a person is gay simply because they struggle with same-sex attraction. Sometimes they'll say that or a a child will come to their parents and say, I'm gay. And, And instead of freaking out, you say, tell me what you mean. Why do you think that? Because the attraction in itself does not mean that a person is gay. Or even if a person has had a same-sex sexual encounter or were molested and now have confused feelings, it doesn't mean that they are now gay. It simply means they have some confused feelings. They need some help to work that out. Same-sex orientation, I see that is now as a progression from attraction to orientation, is the development now more of a behavioral mindset where one begins to take on the identity around their same-sex attraction. In other words, they might not be acting out yet, but now we see this, they're starting to give into this. It's more of an orientation now. It's, it's a stronger, more fixed, persistent, emotional, romantic attraction that causes them to feel they're oriented toward the same sex. Now, some authors, some uh, teachers, leaders, counselors uh, call orientation and attraction as the same thing. They put it together, and that's fine. I just see that there's a progression that often happens. Same-sex behavior, then, is when a person acts out romantically, physically, emotionally, and sexually with people of the same sex. Repeated sinful behavior leads, then, to a gay identity. People often announce themselves as gay at at this level. Now, identity is a big part of the gay struggle. The world says, your sexual desire defines who you are. God says, our identity is rooted not in our sexuality, but in being his beloved sons and daughters. We don't build our identity around our brokenness. Once a person takes on the gay identity, they often get angry when we reject their behavioral choices. They feel we're rejecting them as a person because this is now their identity. They can't separate behavior and identity. By the way, they hate the slogan, hate the sin, love the sinner. That's offensive to them. Number, the good news, again, is change is possible. We can all find healing and live in victory in the midst of our brokenness. There is hope. In, in 1 Corinthians 6, 11 that we read, it says some of you were once like this. That means they've, come, they've, they're, they've found freedom. We're no longer like that. We are now, have been, been made holy, being, we've been cleansed, we've been made right with God. How? By the calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the work of the Spirit of God. That's the only hope for any of us. 
God would not call homosexual behavior and lust sin if it was not possible to change our behavior. And also, in working with people caught up in the gay, gay uh, struggle, the goal is not complete change to heterosexuality. The goal is a life of victory and holiness by God's grace. People change to varying degrees. Some experience a total release from same-sex attraction, but most, most people experience a lessening of the attraction and the ability to walk in victory. Some choose celibacy, and some go on to experience heterosexual marriage. Counseling and the support of a loving church community are key to helping people find freedom. So let me move on to transgenderism. Trying to pack a whole lot in here, so just hang, <laughs> just hang in here with me. Um, transgenderism is not the same as homosexuality. In homosexuality, people embrace their biological sex and are attracted to people of the same sex. But in, with transgender people, they reject their biological sex and present themselves as the opposite sex. And they may be attracted to people of either sex. What is really a mental health issue has become a political issue and a progressive ideology being pushed hard in our culture on all fronts right now. A transgender person is living out of a gender identity that is different than their biological sex. Person who identifies as transgender may feel, you might hear them say, I feel like I was born in the wrong body or I was assigned the wrong gender at birth. But the truth is, Gender is not assigned at birth, it's observed as a biological and scientific fact. Gender ideology tries to separate sex and gender. Gender being who you feel you are, and sex being the biological body you are born in. Now, a biblical worldview sees biological sex and gender as one and the same. But in our culture today, they are discussed as two separate parts of a person's identity. We need to understand that so we can communicate, so we, uh, we know what they're trying to say. God made every person male and female, and you can never change the DNA you were born with, no matter how many body parts you cut off or how much, how much testosterone you take to change your appearance, you will always be a biological male or female. That's a scientific fact. In the mental health field, those who struggle deeply with their gender are referred to as gender dysphoric. You'll hear that term. Gender dysphoria is considered a psychological mental health issue and exists on a spectrum from mild to severe. Some with early onset can experience it as early as three years old. But for the majority of kids, with early onset dysphoria, it goes away after puberty. There are many therapists, psychologists, psychiatrists that believe transgenderism is first and foremost a psychopathology, a mental disorder to treat and not a healthy identity to embrace. They believe that affirming transgender confusion is either a terrible dereliction of duty or a political agenda disguised as help. The American College of Pediatricians warns that gender ideology harms children. This is what they say. A person's belief that he or she is something they are not is at best a sign of confused thinking. When an otherwise healthy biological boy believes he is a girl, or an otherwise healthy biological girl believes she is a boy, an objective psychological problem exists that lies in the mind, not the body, and it should be treated as such. Conditioning children into believing a lifetime of chemical and surgical impersonation of the opposite sex is normal and healthful is child abuse. Some professionals are using the myth that people are born transgender to justify engaging in massive, uncontrolled, and yes, it's experimental uh, treatment on children. Who, the children who actually have a psychological condition that would otherwise resolve itself after puberty in the vast majority of cases. The medical approach being ta taught is gender-affirming care. Sounds nice, doesn't it? 
which means instead of trying to understand the underlying cause of a child's distress and their struggle and their confusion, un instead of trying to understand what, what, where, what's happening here, you instead affirm the child and help them embrace their inner identity that is contrary to their biological sex and you start them on a path toward transition. That's what gender affirming care is. One of the tenets of gender ide ideology is that a child's feelings are infallible indicators of gender. Since when do we let children decide life-altering decisions? They don't even know they shouldn't eat candy all day. It, gets, it is really bizarre when you step back and look at where we're at as a culture. Sad. The common protocol of gender-affirming care is to put young children struggling with their gender identity on puberty blockers to stop the normal development of puberty that causes one development, the development of one's biological sex. The idea behind puberty blockers is to postpone puberty to give the child more time to decide if they want to be a boy or a girl. The tragedy is that once you start a child down this road, almost all of them become conditioned to continue and move on to hormone drugs and sometimes surgeries to change their bodies. This is experimental. And we know puberty blockers cause irreversible damage in a child's body. But the parents and the child, they're being lied to and told they can stop whenever they want with no ill effects. It's institutional child abuse. A large study just came out just a couple weeks ago, a large study from the Mayo Clinic that shows puberty blockers cause permanent health problems. If the child wants to continue to transition, they're given cross-sex hormones to testosterone or estrogen. They then move on to reassignment surgeries on their bodies. Girls as young as 15 are getting double mastectomies. This is a serious moral and ethical problem in allowing irreversible, life-changing procedures to be formed on minors who are too young to give valid consent. So the bottom line is that gender confusion or dysphoria is a diagnosable mental health disorder that needs treatment, not affirmation. It is much like anorexia. So maybe we're more familiar with anorexia. There's so much similarities in the treatment and, and the progression of this. John Hopkins University, distinguished professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences, Paul McHugh, says he sees similarity in the treatment of those suffering from anorexia and those who identify themselves as transgender. He says this, no amount of subtracted weight will deliver the bodily comfort the anorexic seeks because her weight was never the real problem. He states mental health professionals must endeavor to change the anorexic's wrong view of her body, not the body itself. Goes on to say, policymakers and the media are doing no favors to the public or the transgender by treating their confusion as a right in need of defending rather than as a mental disorder that deserves understanding, treatment, and prevention. We do not tell a child struggling with anorexia that their thinking and their behavior is good and normal. Neither should we with those struggling with gender confusion. Transgenderism is a mental disorder. Now, people will get angry at us for saying this, but it's truth. And the truth is what's gonna set people free. The medical and scientific truth is that most cases of gender incongruence in childhood resolve by the time the child reaches adolescence or adulthood. According to the DSMV, this, this, is, this, is, this is startling, 98% of gender confused boys and 88% of gender confused girls eventually accept their biological sex after naturally passing through puberty and are happy with their biological sex. That's true. You can find that statistic all over the place. But if they're pushed onto puberty blockers and encouraged in their gender confusion, they now become conditioned 
in another path of destruction in their lives. This is why it's so wrong and abusive to give them puberty blockers, hormones, and life-altering surgeries they may regret later. The American College of Pediatricians writes, what compassionate and reasonable person would condemn young children to this fate, knowing that, a, that after puberty, as many as 88% of girls and 98% of boys will eventually accept reality and achieve a state of mental and physical health. Now listen, it's normal for children to engage in play and activities normally associated with the opposite sex, boy playing with dolls, and, you know, girls, football, whatever. This does not mean, because they have this attraction to some of these things, it does not mean they're destined to be gay or trans. So let's let our kids be kids, and let's keep modeling healthy male and female identities for them. Now, I mentioned many of the people that have gone down this trans path and transitioning, they're beginning to now detransition, and they're beginning to sue doctors and therapists who led them down this path of destruction. They're broken people, and they're going to be coming into our churches looking for acceptance, help, and discipleship, and healing. We need to understand what we're dealing with. A common manipulative tool to get parents to comply is to tell them if they don't affirm their child's choice to be transgender and allow puberty blockers and use their new gender name and pronouns, the child will most likely commit suicide. They ask parents, do you want a live transgender child or a dead child? If you want your child alive, you must affirm their new chosen gender and allow them to transition. This is a bold-faced lie, it's manipulation, it's emotional blackmail. And this has happened all over the place. And we're now hearing the stories coming out of how parents were blackmailed and pushed into this. I mean, what parent would say, well, I want a dead child? I mean, it's, it's, it's so wrong. Now, it's true that those with mental health issues struggle with suicidal thoughts at times, but the fact is statistics do not bear out that affirming a child's transgender choices and feelings reduces the rate of suicides. Studies show the exact opposite, that the actual risk of suicide is greater in those who have transitioned than those who don't. Studies in Sweden bear it out. You can go do your research. In my book, I point you to different places. Unlike homosexuality, the Bible does not call out transgenderism in the same way as it does homosexuality. But it's clear that transgenderism is not compatible with a biblical worldview of God's creation and purposes. Transgenderism does not reflect God's divine creation in order in living according to one's biological sex as God created us, male and female. Mark Yarhouse, he puts it this way. He's an author that writes on this. The theological concerns rest in the denial of the integrity of one's own sex and an overt attempt at marring the sacred image of maleness or females, femaleness formed by God. There's a lot more we could talk about from a theological perspective. But let me just... Uh, quickly go on. Some of the re revisionist arguments, uh, I gave a number of, of them in the book, but let me just mention three that you're going to hear as you, as you begin ministering to those caught up in this gender uh, confusion. The, the first argument you hear is gender is a social construct and tr transgenders are a variation of God's creation spectrum. So, so they will say in Genesis you have male and female and those are two ends of the spectrum and in between then are variations or hybrids and transgenders fit in the spectrum of God's creation. That's one argument they, they make. Uh, the response to that is, whenever the scriptures mention sex categories of humanity, it only names male and female. Genesis 1 is talking about biological sex and does not separate it from gender identity. And again, every cell in our human body remains coded with our birth gender for life. God made us male and female, which means our bodies bear God's image, not just our rational minds. 
We are the visible representation of the invisible God through which he manifests himself to the world. He breathed his life-giving spirit in us, and now we now bear his image in male and female bodies. Our bodies are sacred. There's a whole teaching out there that ties into gender ideology that separates the body, the, that the body is not sacred. Again, it's all your feelings and who you think you are, and you can do whatever you want to the body. But as a Christian world, we, as our Christian belief, the body is sacred. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Argument two, eunuchs are similar to transgenders and Jesus affirmed them. The assertion is because Jesus talked about uh, eunuchs uh, and he affirmed them, and there's similarities between that and transgenders, so Jesus must approve. Uh, what well, eunuchs were castrated males are those with congenital defects that caused them to remain celibate. They were not another sex or gender. The fact that some men are born without reproductive organs and thus incapable of heterosexual reproduction has no bearing on whether transgender behavior expressions are acceptable. It's just, you can't equate that because that's not what Jesus was talking about. That's not what uh, eunuchs are. And the, the third argument you will hear is the fact that some are born intersex proves that there are more than two genders. I have recently read some some editorials that were written in the newspaper, and this is the one that they will often throw out. Well, there's, there are people are born intersex, so that, uh, that me, uh, means that uh, there, is, there are other genders. Intersex does not mean neither male nor female. It is different from transgender. There are more than 16 different conditions classified as intersex. Um, 99% of people with intersex conditions are clearly biological male or female in their chromosomes and external genitalia. The other 1% are those born with both male and female genitalia. And this is a genital defect, not a third sex. Um, so again, you, you gotta understand how hard they're stretching to try to justify things. Contributing factors of transgenderism, again, we don't really know why some people have this struggle early on. Uh, people are not born homosexual or transgender. There is no transgender gene, just as there's no homosexual gene. For many, the initial feeling that they have is not a choice, and they're not sinful for having those feelings. And like all aspects of human brokenness, it's what we do with these impulses that determines if it becomes a sin issue. There are choices involved in choosing to present as the opposite sex. We need to keep in mind, again, that we're dealing with a mental health disorder. So in my book, again, I, I address a number of contributing factors. Let me just mention two that are kind of at the top of the list. The one we've already been talking about uh, is underlying mental health issues and disorders. Preston Sprinkle, who has written a lot about this and worked with people struggling with gender issues, writes this. Many trans people, especially teenagers, have co-occurring mental health concerns and sometimes several, like anxiety, depression, and eating disorder. Trans people also experience borderline personality disorder, schizophrenia, obsessive compulsive disorder, attention deficit hyperactive disorder, and autism spectrum disorder at a higher rate than the general public. For example, according to one study, people with gender dysphoria are 10 times more likely to be on the autism spectrum than non-dysphoric people. Uh, so we need to lovingly come alongside of people and walk with them to help them. The, the second uh, area I just want to mention is what we call trendy peer pressure and the search for identity and acceptance. And this has become really big uh, right now. Uh, trendy, the search for identity acceptance. Uh, kids are claiming to be trans. They have no history of, of dysphoria from young on. They just come out and all at once decide they're trans. It's a popular issue in our culture. Uh, it's, it's, a tr it's part of be become part of a trendy peer group identity. Uh, peers are a huge factor in today's teens taking on this identity. Abigail Schreier in her book Irreversible Damage states that the sudden spike in transgender identification among adolescent girls is a peer contagion. And social media is a huge influence in this. Uh, so it, a lot of it has to do uh, 
with tr acceptance, it usually starts around puberty uh, with these, mostly with girls in this way. Um, it's called, Dr. Lippman calls it rapid onset gender dysphoria. In other words, all, it all at once comes out and people all at once, I am, I am transgender. And usually you'll see it clustered in friend groups uh, as it comes out. Um, Yeah, so much to say, it's a little time. Okay, the, the good news is many are beginning to transition back to their biological sex and gender. Even after embracing transgender ide ideology, undergoing gender reassignment surgery, people are coming back to the way God created them, male and female. And the good news is no one is beyond God's redemptive reach and love. Let's not write anybody off. Let's not write anybody off in that way. Let me end with some guidance for the church going forward. God intends the church to be a safe place for these people to come into. The healing, whether it's homosexuality, transgender, or whatever sexual issues, healing happens in the context of healthy relationships in the body of Christ. That's the way God designed the church, and that's where God is wanting to bring the broken people. They've experienced rejection, many of them, trauma, carrying the weight of hurt, abuse, fear, anxiety, depression. They felt set apart early in life, and they're, and they're saying, does God have any answers for me? So we've come alongside of them, speaking truth and patiently entering the healing journey. Listen, it's a journey. It's not a moment of repentance. It's a journey. It includes repentance. Healing of sexual issues comes through healthy relationships and the support of the Christian community. Here, uh, real quickly, first of all, I would say this. Help your people have a biblical understanding about the sexual issues of our day and grow in compassion toward the sexual struggler. They're hearing it. They're getting all this information about it. The church needs to be giving the correct information. And I believe we need to be speaking about this uh, from the pulpit. You need, it, we take risks in loving people. Uh, some people will feel uncomfortable that we're ministering to those kind of people. Um, and they may leave your church. But uh, we're willing to take the risk of loving the sexually broken. We fear what we don't understand. So we need to teach that. And listen, also, acceptance does not mean approval of their behavior, of them or anyone else in your church. What it means is you value them as a person loved and created by God. We accept them. We don't approve of them. We accept them. And in that acceptance and love, we walk them into truth and healing in their lives. Listen, pastors that are here, you set the tone on this. Uh, we need to talk about the tough, tough issues from the pulpit. But when you do, make sure you're speaking truth with much grace because you probably have people sitting there that are either silently struggling with some of these issues, have a family member that is, or know, have a friend that is. And how you present this is gonna determine uh, what kind of church you have and bring in healing. Number two, listen deeply, get to know them, take time to hear their story. Listening is the most loving thing you can do. Listen to their story. There's a reason they are struggling. Don't be so quick just to say, well, the Bible says. We'll get to that. But let me first of all hear your story. Then they feel safe, they feel accepted, and then you can go from there. Number three, share your story of brokenness and offer wholesome friendships. When people see us as fellow strugglers, they're more apt to open up and share with us. Number four, exercise much patience and offer God's love and forgiveness. Share the gospel, uh, but it's a journey. There's no quick fix in, in this. There are a lot of ups and downs on the journey. There's progress. There's setbacks along the way. Uh, I mean, just deal, I don't need, our church deals a lot in, in healing and working with people with pornography and sexual issues. There's, there's setbacks, but we're, we believe we can walk in victory. Offer, offer them prayer counseling, Christian counseling. Six, provide support to single mothers and single fathers. Uh, fathers with their children, we need to come alongside of them. They need uh, those mother-father figures. Seven, if at all possible, invest in a family restroom in your church. Uh, that can be really important as, as you're working with uh, people struggling with homosexuality and these gender things. And listen, I would just say this. It's not wrong in asking transgenders to use either the family restroom or the one on, uh, according to their biological sex. It's not wrong to do that. 
and, and train your children, last, to train your children to stand for Christ without biblical convictions, with biblical convictions, and how to be kind toward those who struggle with their sexual identity. Listen, your children, if you're, especially if you're in public school, your children probably have a classmate that is dealing with e either gender issues or, or some of these homosexual issues. Make sure you're having your discussions with your children, your youth group. Pro provide them with the teaching, the support, some of these things we're sharing. They need to hear this because they're hearing the other side in that way. So I hope the teaching has helped you to do just that with your church. God bless you. It's been an honor to be here with you. Uh, amen. So now I, I, I hope you heard what I heard. When I read Lester's book, I've never met you before, but I, I've, I heard your love and compassion in your book. And now you spoke to us in person, and did you hear that? You know, did you hear that? So thank you so much for being willing to come and take the time to start the conversation with us and, and for, for cramming all that in a short period of time. I appreciate that. We have a gift for you. Just to say thank you. Thank you. I, I, I want us to pray for Lester because, as you can imagine, he's on the front line here on an issue that some of us haven't even had the courage to talk about yet. So you know the enemy is not happy with our brother. And I would just like to pray for you. Thank you. Father, thank you for our brother. You've given him this ministry, and I know a little bit in our conversations. He didn't seek out to be a specialist in this area. He, he just responded to your call. And Lord, he's put his time, his effort, his energy, and the gifts you've given to him to helping the church. And we really do want to be the body of Christ who can reach out in love and grace with biblical truth to help those people in our, in our communities and our families who are struggling with you know, this issue that, as we were told, is not any greater or lesser sin, but it's still... Thank you, Jesus, that you're able to redeem all and everything. We pray for our brother and his family. I know, Lord, the enemy would not like him to be out and about and sharing this truth. You know, I pray that you would just guard him, uh, protect him, uh, keep his, um, his family safe and physically, spiritually, emotionally, Lord. As he talks, we know how the enemy loves to twist words and use things. We just ask, Father, go before him and continue to increase and influence his ministry with your church. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, brother. Thank you. Wow, a lot to digest, but you have lunch time to do that. So I have a special, uh, special privilege. I'm going to invite uh, Sean Federhoff, who is the executive director of our Twin Pines camp, to come and share what's exciting at Twin Pines this year. So give your attention to Sean. While he's coming, by the way, on the table back there, the, the church center literature table, there is a piece of paper with a QR code. If you want to get Lester's book, just use the QR code. It'll take you right to Amazon, and you can get it there. Sean. Thank you for the privilege to share with the conference about the ministry of Twin Pines and what's exciting this year. Well, I'll tell you the exciting thing this year is we are celebrating 60 years of ministry at Twin Pines. And that is, yes, yes. I just want to ask a couple questions. And if you could raise your hand, how many of you here today have been to Twin Pines? All right, great. How many people here today would say that Twin Pines had an impact on your life? Raise your hand. Great. Uh, or how about on your family or on your church? Uh, over the 60 years that we've been doing ministry at Twin Pines, we've strived to impact people's lives. And I think what we just saw by the raising of the hands of people who have been impacted personally, their churches, their families, Twin Pines impacts lives. We want to be part of multiplying. 
uh, believers and multiplying the kingdom. That's why we do what we do. The ministry has grown over those 60 years to impact people globally. I wished at some point we would have started keeping track of people who went into full-time ministry or people who were just serving in ministry in their local churches because I believe if we had that list, we would see that there is a global impact because of lives being impacted by the ministry at Twin Pines. And we have a desire. We have a desire to continue to impact lives and to be a part of the denomination and sharing that gospel message that is prevalent in our denomination with people as well, and to see the denomination thrive and grow as well as the ministry of Twin Pines. So, as we celebrate 60 years of ministry and impacting people's lives, we'd like to invite you to come on June 1st to our open house. That open house will be from 10 to 4 p.m. We have activities for everyone. Uh, we will have an anniversary celebration at 1 p.m. And shortly thereafter, we're going to gather all those who are there who have been a part of staff in some way and have a special campfire for them. And I don't think that if you were ever on staff, that's something you're going to want to miss because it's going to be fun. I promise. Um, so we are excited about that day and what we will celebrate that day as well. And the next slide we, I want to share that we are preparing for summer camp. And we have lots of things going on every summer. People think, oh, summer camp, eight weeks of summer. That's great. But in those eight weeks, we run about 23 different programs, anywhere from kindergarten through seniors in high school, plus everybody sitting here could come to adult camp and be a part of, of summer camp. It's a great opportunity for everyone. Speaking of summer camp, on the next slide, you'll see that we're still looking for some summer staff. We're looking for young people who want to make a difference. We're looking for those teenagers and, and college age kids who want to be a part of something this summer that's bigger than them. And the opportunity is there for them to serve at Twin Pines for uh, the whole summer or just part of the summer. We're willing to work with people who can't commit for the whole summer but would like to be there and be a part of that for part of the summer as well. In my last slide, I have one more invitation for you. On Saturday, November 16th, we are going to have an anniversary gala, is what we're calling it, at Weaver's Banquet Facility in Denver. So if you can't make the trek all the way up to Twin Pines to be with us on June 1st, we'd ask you to join us on November 16th for that special evening as we really celebrate all that God does through the ministry of Twin Pines. And I just want to say thank you once again for allowing me to share these things. I know I think I kind of stand between you and lunch, so um, I, I could give more details, but I want you to eat. Um, we are EC afterwards, after all, so uh, I look forward to sharing anything else that you'd like to know that's going on at the ministry, or if you have questions, or if you have suggestions about things that we might be able to partner with with you or with your church to share the, the gospel message. That's why we're there. That's why we do what we, want to, what we do. So thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. <clears throat> Thanks for the snazzy cup. There are perks to being bishop. Yeah. <laughs> also, I want to announce, uh, thank you for your generosity. We collected $1,565 for the Andrew Fund. So thank you very much. <clears throat> so this afternoon is our um, church health community and equipping experience. Uh, the first thing that I would like to do before uh, Wayne comes to, to uh, give us his presentation or while he's coming, we can do all this at once, I guess, the tellers are gonna be handing out a sheet. Take that and um, on this sheet, you will see where the discussion group locations are and uh, you'll look for your district and it'll tell you where you're going to be. <clears throat> There'll be some in this, this facility here, some in Sawyer Gym, which is out the door. 
right around the corner there, and then S-165 and 166, go out the door, turn left, you're going down past the swimming pool, and down that way. I think it's the same thing, yep. <clears throat> All right, everyone got your, uh, once you get your paper, you can kind of just keep it on your lap for a second and, and give your attention to, uh, just do not listen to me, give your attention to Wayne. Okay, give your attention to uh, Reverend Wayne Hauk, who is the associate for our church health community. Greetings in the name which is above every other name, the name at which demons flee, the only name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved, the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So thank you uh, for the opportunity to share with you. Uh, this is, I've been the church health associate for five months, and as you already heard, there's a number of initiatives that seem to migrate their way towards church health because I'm the new guy, and I inherit a lot of those things. And, I, and I, how many of you, just by, by show of hands, it, usually sit in the same general vicinity at national conference, like within a few seats? Yeah, most of us, right? It's like Sunday morning, we have our assigned seats, and we have the same seats on uh, at national conference every year. We always know where we're supposed to be. And uh, this is literally the first time I've ever been on this platform. And uh, from where we usually sit, you can see that there's a lot of things on the bishop's table. I don't know if the people over here can see. There's a lot of things on the bishop's table. And until I walked up here, I didn't notice there's a little button that he has at his left side. And, and I walk up here and I, is this a trap door? Is that what this is? If you see me reach for that button, yeah, so you're just, over, you're just done. let me know, okay, if you see him reaching for the button. I appreciate that. But uh, I want to thank the Reverend Dr. Gary Keener for uh, kind of helping me transition into this role. And I don't know if you guys have seen Gary since he's been here this year. You notice how tan he is and how relaxed he seems now? Uh, it's a lot different last, than last year, isn't it, Gary? Amen. Uh, but I want to thank our team. Uh, one of the th privileges that I've had is to kind of gather a new team in the church health community. Uh, and so I'm blessed to be able to share on a regular basis with Mike Colson and Brandon Segan, who's going to work his way up here in just a moment. Adam Roberts, Louie Bennett, Janer Bestwick, Jesse Bills, and Vince Jones. That's our, our current team. And if, if you look at the credentialing report, you're going to see a lot of those names. I don't think that's a coincidence. But a lot of the guys, probably half of our team is receiving uh, ordination uh, in one way or another over the next couple of months. So I'm really excited about that. Uh, there, there are a few initiatives that we have undertaken, and I know that you've been paying attention to my uh, EC leader reports on a regu regular basis. I, we write those articles uh, almost every month, and so I'm privileged to be able to share some of the things that are new in the church health community. And one of those things is that we have now taken over the responsibility for pastoral health, not just church health, but pastoral health. And it would be kind of absurd to su suggest that we could have healthy churches if we don't have healthy pastors at the same time. And uh, I was, got to be, because Matt Hill invited me to make a video last year, I got to be one of the poster children for uh, receiving counseling as a pastor. I was greatly blessed by the testimony of Bishop Emeritus Sigmund uh, in his sharing as well last year. But uh, we recognize that there are a lot of churches and lay delegates, PRCs, that may not have ready resources to suggest for their pastors to receive counseling, whether it's marital or whether it's uh, based on the struggles that they're dealing with. And my next 
uh, EC Leader article will be the formal introduction of a resource that we want to make available to all of the churches in our denomination, a group called Serving Leaders Ministries, which is based in Westchester, Pennsylvania. They've also got an office in Willow Grove, Pennsylvania, but they do a lot of their ministry by Zoom, uh, even internationally. And so we're going to be sharing more information about that. One of the one of my objectives as the New Church Health Associated is to remove two stigmas, and you might have read those in my report. One of those is it's okay to ask for help. In fact, it's more than okay. It almost ought to be mandatory that we, on a regular basis, find some place to offload some of the burdens that we carry as pastors. We've heard earlier today that pastoral ministry is not easy. It's really hard and it carries some emotional consequences. And so we're hoping that we can connect pastors and church leaders, lay delegates, uh, those in leadership positions in your churches with reliable resources if you don't already have access to them in your community. So you'll see more about that as well. The second stigma that I think that we face is uh, the permission that we might have to be able to talk about numbers. And I, I know that in the church we say that it's not very spiritual to talk about nickels and noses and butts and bucks and those kinds of things, but if we're realistic about it, we would all like to see our churches grow. And I want to see our churches grow. Because I believe that each one of our churches represents a gospel opportunity in the community in which it is planted. We recognize that we've been planted in a lot of different kinds of communities, some urban, some rural, at Many years ago, when, before I was stationed, I, I looked at, uh, at one of our churches. I, I don't even remember which one it was, so that's probably good. But I did a Google Earth search of, hey, I wonder where this church is. And, you know, you can draw back on Google Earth further and further away. And I kept looking for the next building. <laughs> you know, it, it was fields and woods, and stuff, but I couldn't find a house or anything. I thought, wow. But so I want to remove that stigma that it's okay to talk about numbers in, in church. I mean, there's a lot of numbers that we're all familiar with in the Bible, right? How many disciples did Jesus have, right? He had 12. How many days was Jesus in the tomb? And, and Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, numbers. Okay, so God's okay with numbers, right? And so I, I want us to be used to the idea that we can, we can actually talk about numbers. That is in no way to shame anybody whose church is small or struggling. Some of them want to be small because we live in a small community. But in other cases, the community has grown exponentially. Ours would be one of those where the farms are no longer farms. Now they're all housing developments. And so is the church keeping pace with the growth of the community? That ought, that ought to be our measuring stick. Not one church, not one fellowship, not one pastor to the other. But how are we doing in influence, influencing our community for the things of God? And, and Brendan, if you want to come on up, one of the opportunities that we have available to us also is a connection with Christian Endeavor. We're grateful that Josh Good's over there. He's, uh, I want to get a picture with Mike Knapp and Josh together, if that would be all right. I want to be in the middle, the two best beards in the room. Amen? <laughs> and so I want, to, I want to get a picture with those guys a little bit later. But uh, we're grateful that Christian Endeavor, not dissimilarly from a lot of our churches, has been revitalized in a lot of ways. And so uh, Brandon uh, is also receiving credentials, but he is the representative of our, the church health community, of our team for Christian Endeavor. So if you want to share with us, Brandon, we appreciate that. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I am honored to speak in front of you today at our um, national conference um, as you said, my name is Brandon Segan. I am the discipleship pastor at Hope Community Church in Fogelsville. If you don't know where that is, think of Allentown and go like 10 minutes west. Um, for those of you who don't know what Christian Endeavor is, it is a resource to help churches with the intentional discipleship of the youth. Christian Endeavor's mission is to inspire, equip, and encourage churches to develop youth as Christ-centered leaders. In these past two days, we've heard a lot about our vision as a denomination to be a dynamic movement of God, focusing on discipleship. And Bishop Randy gave a beautiful Episcopal address yesterday, even describing his parents' church raising up leaders from within. In 2 Timothy 3, Paul is given a charge to Timothy as a leader in the church. In verses 14 and 15, it says, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, 
known from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. If we're to raise up leaders like Timothy in our church, it's essential to focus on discipling our young leaders in the Word of God. We have a focus on the Great Commission at this conference to make disciples. We can't forget to make disciples of our youth. Christian Endeavor is focused on this mission that we also have, to intentionally disciple the youth to develop Christ-centered leaders. They don't do this by just handing out lesson books for the youth to go through, but rather by training the youth leaders to train our youth in the youth ministry philosophy that empowers and equips the youth to take their faith seriously and to be active within their own youth ministry. So no matter where your church may be at, maybe you have a, a big youth group or you don't have a youth at all, Whatever space, this partnership is meant to strengthen or to start your youth ministries. Now, if you notice in the church health report, one recurring statement that we've heard is that they have no children or no youth or young families at their church. Christian Endeavor can help with that. And the youth are out there, but our churches need to be intentional about discipling them. Last year, I was charged with leading our youth group at Hope Community Church. And I had one student, and she was a senior. So at our last meeting, I sat down with her, me and my co-leaders, and we were praying. And when it came to my turn for a prayer request, I looked around, and I said, I pray that God can fill all the seats in this room. And then she graduated, and I was like, there goes my youth group. <laughs> but then I got connected with Josh Good great beard over there, over at Christian Endeavor. We sat down, he listened to me, and through tailoring a strategy designed specifically for my church and my community, after a whole lot of training and a whole lot of prayer, our youth group has consistently around 10 kids now, filling up that room. So praise God for that. And thanks. And over this past year, I've had a lot of time with Josh. And it is clear that he has a heart for the youth. Our heart of Christian Endeavor is to get more of our churches and our denomination involved in that training that Christian Endeavor offers. And that we do that through cohort meetings where we get together with churches in our area or just in our denomination and we just talk about um, what we're going through in our youth programs, having that support for each other, giving each other different ideas. And it's just so fruitful. Or by sitting down personally with Josh and having that tailored uh, design for our youth group. Now, to spread awareness of this amazing resource, we have organized a denomination-wide youth group hangout day. It's going to be a lot of fun. So there's cards over there with Josh. He's got them. And on there is the information that you need. Um, this is an amazing opportunity for the youth to get together and worship with other believers of their age. And after that, we're also going to have an online training session sometime later in the summer before the new semester kicks off to help train our youth leaders to include their youth in their ministry. And actually on the back they have a curriculum called Hippos to Honeybees. And there's a QR code and you can scan that and it'll help you train to make your youth group from hippos, like the hungry hungry hippos who just come and consume, into honeybees who help out the hive and there are working bees. And the philosophy behind this is that we're not focused on youth ministry. We're focused on the youth in ministry, getting them equipped, giving them opportunities to serve their youth ministry and, and to take ownership, to train them up as leaders. And Josh is an excellent resource for all of this and for training, so please utilize him. Um, get connected with him. Tongue talk to me. Um, some churches here have been in those cohorts. Talk to them. See how... The, Christian Endeavor has helped them in their youth ministry. So thank you. Thank you for giving us time. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and we also pay for your first year. So if a church is considering joining, hey, we want to try this thing out, there are scholarships available through the church health community budget, so please let us know how we can help you with that. 
One of the things that you may remember from last year's conference was the uh, breakout session that we had where uh, we worked through by district a, a church survey, which was called the Church Health Checkup. And I'm, I'm sure many of you remember that sitting around it, uh, in a lot of us in this room and in other parts of the facility here, uh, talking about how uh, we could measure the health of our church. And that's something that uh, Gary Keener had put together along with a little bit of help, but that's one of the last things that uh, he was able to do as, as the associate. But so uh, what we've seen is in talking with a number of churches, and I've been to a number of district meetings and, and shared with quite a few of you, so I thank you for the opportunity to meet with you and share my heart and, and for you sharing your heart with me. There's a few things that I want to talk about. I included these in, in one of my uh, articles or one of my reports a little while ago. And so there are four main concerns that we have seen raised up over the course of the last five months and even before that since I've been the associate. Now you may, may remember that it was that the survey is looking at six different areas of ministry based on Acts chapter 2 and how the first churches that ever existed were uh, measuring their, their, uh, their ability to reach the community. And uh, two of those are regularly amongst the lowest scoring uh, amongst our churches. I'm going to talk about both of those today. Probably not going to be a surprise to anybody. One of those is evangelism, which we will get to in just a little bit. And the second is discipleship. And so I want to talk about those. As, as the bishop mentioned a little uh, while ago, I guess yesterday, yesterday evening, those two are really closely associated. In fact, often inseparable in a lot of ways. So I want to look at the four main concerns that have been raised by pastors, by lay delegates that have come to me and they said, Wayne, what can you do to help us? Because... And these are sort of the fill in the blanks on the end of that because statement. And the first one is we don't have any young people. And Brandon just talked about that. A number of our churches look around and they say there's a lot of gray hair and there's not very many young people, not young families. And how can we reach young families in our community? And, and they might hearken back to a day when they, they remember, remember when there were so many kids in the Sunday school program and the youth group was robust and, and all these activities were happening and what's happened? Why have things changed? And we can say, well, where are the young people? A lot of our churches aren't ready to receive young people. But I've had a couple of discussions with pastors where I said, what would you do if, if a family showed up on Sunday morning right before your first service and they had three kids with them? And he would say, well, I, we don't have anything for you. And we understand that volunteerism, particularly in a church that is small, is, is a difficult thing. And, and it can be really discouraging to be prepared for somebody, somebody that doesn't show up. You know, I, I've got a, a somebody that says, hey, I'm, I'm ready to minister to families. We've got a, a nursery volunteer that's been waiting week after week and, and not had the opportunity to use their gifts and graces. And it can be really discouraging. But one of the most effective ways I believe that we can grow younger as a church is to start making disciples of younger people. And that may very well be outside the church. But most of us live in a community or work in a place or hang out at a coffee shop or, or whatever it might be where we have contact with people that might be even younger than the demographic that we're currently seeing in our church. So we can, can we find ways to intentionally connect with those people to make disciples of younger people? And I would suggest to you that that doesn't necessarily include an invitation to come to our church on Sunday morning. But can I invest in you over a period of time? Can I show you the love of Christ? Can I teach you something? Can I share of myself with you? And I will promise you that that is a spirit that resonates strongly within the hearts of people that are younger than most of us in the room. And so one of the things that the church health community would like to do is to help equip you to make disciples. You know, you hear me talk about it, that there's a lot of curriculum. You can, I mean, you can go on Google. Don't do it right now. But if you Google during uh, any time, during, you can do it during Matt's uh, presentation. Okay, all right. So, <laughs> But no, but if, if that was out loud, wasn't it? I said that out. Anyways, but if if you if you were to, to look up hey discipleship materials, you're going to find an infinite number of hits on your Google search. 
And so we have some recommendations that are not a silver bullet, but they're reliable resources that we've been using over a period of years. And if you, if you say, hey, we don't know what to pick, we're, we're happy to help point you into that direction. It's not, there's not an exclusivity uh, component to that, but it's, hey, here's something that's good and, and we believe you'd be blessed by it. At least you can help get started that way. And so I think that's one of the ways that we can grow younger. The second thing that we hear from people is, is we just don't have enough money, and sometimes that means energy or even hope to go on much longer. I've already had, I think, three or four conversations with people from National Conference since yesterday from churches that say, like, we, we don't really know how much longer we can go on. We've done the math, and, and the money's going to run out in a matter of just X number of months, and, and, and we look around, there just doesn't seem to be a lot of energy, and, and it's just kind of a difficult situation for us to walk through. And one of the things that we've seen, though, is in the church health community is, a lot of you are familiar with Dave Ramsey's principles, aren't you? Amen, right? Okay, so we, we understand that the debt snowball, you remember how Dave teaches about the debt snowball? He says, pay off your, your smallest debt first. Right? And then he always, but he says celebrate that. That doesn't mean you're out of debt, but you paid off the smallest debt that you've gotten. He says go out for a pizza. It used to be a pizza was like $5, but now it's like 17 or something. But you know what I mean. But he says go out for a pizza. Celebrate that little victory. You haven't gotten out of debt. You haven't fixed everything yet. And so what I want to suggest and what I have suggested to churches, you know what, you, you take a small step. You see some little thing. Let's celebrate that. Let's, let's rejoice in what you've seen. It, you're not necessarily robust. Of, you didn't go from 15 people to 100 people. You, you haven't, you haven't tra completely transformed the disciple-making culture of your church yet, but you, you've got some small measure of success. So let's celebrate that. And so let's, let's try to find ways together how we can encourage you with, with one small thing that's a little bit better than it was yesterday. My wife and I bought an old house a number of, about a year and a half ago, and, and there's a lot of stuff that we're fixing up over, over periods of time. And, and every once in a while, we'll, say, we'll do something, you know, we'll paint a wall, we'll, we got new windows, we, you know, we'll do all these things. And we say, well, you know what, it's not perfect, but it's better than it was. And so I think that that's the way we have to kind of look at our churches sometimes. It's not perfect, it's never going to be, is it? But we can make it better than it was. And the next thing that I want to point out is that, that people are saying, like, our, our people don't want to change. You know, there's a sense of discouragement in church leadership. I and mean, I keep suggesting ideas. We, you know, we, we had somebody come in as a consultant, and, and, and uh, we had you out as the new church health associate, and you spoke to the church, but they don't want to change anything. And I get it. It gets harder to change as we get older, doesn't it? I want to share with, I'm going to share with you this morning or this afternoon. I'm used to talking on more in the morning. But uh, so uh, what, I, what I want to share with you is some personal stories and, and personal things that have actually, conversations that I've had. And one of them was about 10 years ago when I was uh, first uh, preparing to be installed as our pastor. And I met with uh, an older couple. They were older than me. They're technically, technically, they're probably younger than I am now which is a little concerning for me. But anyway, they were, they were sort of the liaison between the older group in the church and the younger people. Like they weren't the oldest of the old group, you know what I mean? And so they were probably around my age. But I, I took them out to breakfast, and I, and I was talking to them like, hey, here's some, here's some thoughts. What do you think about this in the church? What, things that we could address, things that we might be able to change, things that we might be able to to, to look, consider. And, and so I asked them a very direct question. I said, so if, if, it meant, if we could change things in our church so that they were not necessarily your taste, but it would mean that your children and your grandchildren would be happy to come to church with you and I asked them to sort of represent that older group in the church. And I said, if, if we could change those things, and, and you might not like the music style. You might not like the way the pastor dresses. You might not like some of those things. Because, hey, we remember that. But if we could change those things, and your children and your grandchildren would then hey, say, hey, we'll go with you. Would that be okay? And they said no. They said no. We want things the way 
we like them. It's a heartbreaking attitude. But I think if we were to look around our churches, there's a lot of us that would say, yeah, I can see that played out. Sort of the attitude of, like, you can, Pastor, you can preach my funeral and then change anything you want to change. But we can't let that be a discouragement, church. If, if we feel like we are becoming part of a dynamic movement of God and God says, I want you to step into this, and we say, well, let the opinion of man dissuade me from that, then I don't think we're being obedient to what God has called us to do as church leaders. But what I have offered to a numerous uh, churches and, and districts even is I, I understand that you, you've got to go talk to your official board or your ministry council or however your church is run. You've got, to go, you've got to go talk to them, and guess what? You're going to go see them next Sunday. But that's not true for me. So if you need me, and, I, and I've got three invitations, like I said, to come talk, talk to church board meetings since yesterday morning. If you need somebody to be the bad cop, then so be it. I got to confess, I don't like that, but I heard that somebody referred to me as the Gordon Ramsay of church revitalization just <laughs> recently. So, hey, you know what? How many TV shows does he have? I don't know. But in reality, when, when, I read, when I read that statement, our people don't want to change. You could, in many cases, we could say our pastor doesn't want to change. Because I find it difficult to change the things that I've started. Don't you? Uh, the reason we had to move to a new house, I'm only partially kidding about this. The reason we moved to a new house is because I don't like redoing stuff that I did in my house. Like, we, like, I pick a color, you know, we wallpaper, we do something in the house. Like, I don't want, if there comes a time when it technically it needs to be redone, but I'm like, we're just moving, because I don't want to redo <laughs> the stuff that I already did, right? And, and I think the same is true of a lot of us in our churches. We, man, I, don't, I, I, I started that program. I'm not changing that. I think that's probably why they had circuit riders back in the day, right? You didn't have to change anything. You just keep moving. <laughs> but, you know, there's, there's another thing that we hear regularly, and that's that the community's changed a lot over the last 20 or 30 more years. Where churches don't look like the community anymore. And it can be a little bit intimidating. You, know, you look around at, at some of our churches that are predominantly older, predominantly white, predominantly middle class, and we look around at the communities, and, and things have shifted demographically in a lot of our communities. And we think, man, I, I, don't, I don't even know how to talk to these people. Like, literally, they speak a different language than we speak. And so how can I, how can I possibly reach them? And so one of the suggestions that we have come up with is that in, in our church, we started a prayer ministry. It's actually it was a Tom Rainer program called Pray and Go. Some of you may be familiar with it, where you take a, a door hanger, you go out in teams in the community, and you, you pray over houses. Because I've had conversations, like, you know, they, they literally speak a different language than we speak. And, and there's a community near us, a, a, a neighborhood. It's a new development, all new houses. And during Diwali, the whole block is lit up. And most of us are like, what's the wally? <laughs> right? Right, right? But I say, you know, one thing we can genuinely do for anybody, even if they speak a different language than us, is we can pray for them, can't we? And so I encouraged a, a, a couple of our churches. And one of the cool things about being the church health associate is I get to use other churches as sort of guinea pigs. In my, old, in my pharmaceutical research life, before I became a pastor, that meant something very different than what I mean <laughs> Now, so maybe that's not the best analogy, but, but uh, we get to try things out in a way. And so I, I got the door hangers that we had used uh, for our Pray and Go program printed. And on the front of it, it says, it says, we prayed for you today. That's a good thing. That's the message that we share with our English-speaking neighbors. But we put essentially subtitles at the bottom of it. And so we say, it, now it says, we prayed for you in English, but it also says, we prayed for you today in Spanish, 
in Arabic and Hindi. And so like, if the only thing that I could do for a neighbor that I may never even have an actual conversation with is to say, hey, you know what, we, we genuinely prayed for you today. And we care enough about you to try and say it in your own language. I don't speak Spanish. I mean, I was impressed by Val's Spanish. I mean, I, would, I can't even imagine what I would try to do when I sp spoke Spanish. But we've got a long heritage of speaking in the language that our neighbors speak, don't we? There was a guy named Jacob Albright that said that same kind of thing, wasn't there? Because his neighbors spoke German. You, you guys remember the story. You, you've read the book, right? And he said, well, if, if I'm going to try and connect with the neighbors and share the gospel, I've got to speak the language that they speak. And so he wanted to pre preach in German because that's the primary language of most of his neighbors. And so a lot of our neighbors today don't speak church as their first language. But sometimes we have this expectation that, yeah, they speak fluent church when they come in on a Sunday morning, don't we? And we're, gonna, we're talking about discipleship in just a moment, but when, when I was doing one of my earlier one-to-ones with a, a young man from our church, and so this is an example of that getting younger. We had a young a couple that came to our church. They weren't even, didn't even have any children yet. Now they've got uh, two young boys, praise the Lord. Uh, he serves on our security team, and uh, but they, they came to the church. We do a thing called pizza with the pastor. Some of you have the same kind of thing. Somebody's been there for a couple of weeks. You invite them. Hey, let's get together and talk and, 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 and share a little bit. And so I invited him to do a one-to-one -one study with me. And so the, th the third week in, he goes, can I ask you a question? Of course, that's what we're here for. And he said, what's a hymn? And I hear the chuckles in the room. Because I've shared that same story with a number of people from our church and they stood there with their mouth hanging open aghast. How could somebody not know what a hymn is? Because not everybody speaks church, church. And I appreciate that we did the Lord's Prayer. And, and so a lot of times, a lot of, the only question we have, well, is it sins, debts, or trespasses? I'm ready to go. Hit it. <laughs> oh, I didn't mean to... Is, that, is it secure? Okay. If he, again, if he starts reaching, let me know. <laughs> but we need to find ways to speak into the lives of people around us that have dramatically different backgrounds than we have. That may or may not literally speak a different language than we speak. And I believe that when we find ways to do that, it, we're not always going to be successful. But we can recognize, if you've read the first few books of Revelation, you, you recognize that we're going to hear every tongue. Even languages, I believe, that don't even exist anymore. All focused on the worship of the Lamb. And so let's work together to try to find ways to connect with your community. One of the things that, uh, I don't want to call him the Reverend Doctor, he's Gary, okay? So Gary Keener uh, put together was uh, what he called Four Tiers of Discipleship. And, and so this is a, a program that he had taken to numerous churches that I've been trying to use it just as a, a principle by which we can make disciples. And so if we're going to grow healthy as churches, I, I mentioned that discipleship and evangelism are the almost without fail so far, amongst those that I've gotten the results back uh, from the church health checkup, uh, is those are the two weakest areas. And so uh, there are multiple ways in which we need to be making disciples. And I'll just explain it really briefly. We heard something very similar to it uh, at, the, uh, at the, uh, the exponential conferences that we were a part of. And so the first is the crowd, and right, it doesn't matter how big our church is, but a Sunday morning preaching and, and our Sunday morning services is the biggest opportunity, usually, that we have to speak uh, God's word into the lives of people, right? And so we know that Jesus preached to the great multitudes on occasion, not, not all the time, but he, had, he drew big crowds, bigger than any of us ever likely will. And so we want to continue that. That's really important. That's our, our primary connectedness with the community. And I think that's absolutely critical. Whoops, I skipped ahead. And so the second is the small group, right? We know that Jesus made, had his disciples. 
He had those 12 guys that he spent three years with, and he invested in them on a regular basis. And so he was uh, preaching and teaching and being an example to a smaller group, not the multitudes. He didn't tell thousands of people to follow him and take up their cross daily. He told a small select group of people to do that. And, and so we might be leading a Sunday school class or being part of a life group or a home group. And I wrote a, an article for the EC Leader recently about how my wife Tina and I have planted numerous life groups in our churches. And I've had a couple of pastors say, how do you get small groups started? And, and we, use, we look at it as not necessarily church planting, but group planting, where we'll invite people and we'll get things started. And then at a certain point, we can step out. And in a church that's trying to get younger, that was one of the hindrances that we had for a number of years, literally years, where we had young families that said, man, we can't find a life group that's going to work for us because we've got kids and we've got the babysitting issues and all that kind of stuff. There's a lot of hindrances to us getting together. And so what Tina and I said, hey, you know what, we'll help you out. And so four couples that had children got together and I helped facilitate the discussion we use a sermon-based model, and so they were answering questions about the sermon that I had preached on a Sunday morning. And so we, I can help facilitate that discussion. I don't even have to look it up. I mean, I studied it all week. I'm ready to, to go and talk about my own sermon. And Tina, God help her, said, I'll babysit. And they were all boys. <laughs> and so Tina spent time in the basement with a bunch of boys, And I spent time at the dining room table with a group of young couples encouraging them. And after a little while, we said, hey, you know what? I usually write four questions for discussion. Hey, there's four couples here. Go figure. And so they started to take one of those discussions, questions to lead the discussion on. Hey, how about you? next time you take number two? I'll take number three. That's great. And so over a period of time, they became independent. We were able to step out of that, and that group has grown. And other couples now that have come to our church with small children, they say, hey, there is something for us here. And they're able to get connected and be ministered to, and we are just richly blessed by that. And so the inner circle, too, Jesus had his, the three Right, Peter, James, and John, that he invited into some really special experiences that the, the rest of the 12 weren't invited to necessarily. We think about him going a, a, alone to pray, and, and he said, hey, you guys, come with me. I want, you to, I want you to be part of this. And when he went to the Mount of Transfiguration, he said, hey, you guys, come with me. And he invested in them in a way that is particular versus the other disciples, as far as we know from Scripture. And so are we doing the same thing in our churches? Most of us have Sunday morning preaching, praise the Lord. We took homiletics and we work on our sermons all week. I'm I'm really glad for that. And so a lot of us also maybe teach a class or they have a, a men's discussion group or a women's discussion group, those kinds of things. They might be part of a life group or whatever you call them in, in your church. That's that's awesome. But the where I see the, the biggest drop off when we talk to churches and even in entire districts is when it comes to the individual investment in the lives of other people. And so we are encouraging pastors and lay leaders, the entirety of our churches, to invest in the lives of other people. That means getting together and sharing the Word of God and our lives with other people. And in Gary's illustration, it got down to the one-to-one because John said he was the favorite, the disciple that Jesus loved. And so I'm committed as a pastor to continue to invest in in our church in, in each of those ways where we've got multiple opportunities for people to be connected and to grow. And so one one other example, I'm going to make this one quick, but so one of the, one example that, that this happened this past week, and I want to share this with you. Uh, part of the exponential conference was, hey, you know, it's more efficient to connect with more than one guy at a time because it takes you a long time to invest in one guy. So make it two. And so I invited two guys that I knew they were neighbors they knew each other and one had invited the other one to our church and that's awesome and I said hey you guys want to get together with me and do this study together it's 24 weeks and it's going to take us probably a year realistically to get through a six-month study because our schedules are going to be different because the the complexity of our schedules with three guys is even worse than it is with two guys and so I said hey guys you want to get together with that and I said why don't you guys go talk about it I put a little pressure and I invited them in front of their wives 
A lot of that. And so one of the things that we often hear is that guys aren't used to praying out loud, particularly in public. And most of the time I'm meeting in diners and restaurants, you know, for breakfast. Guys love breakfast. Amen? Amen. Right? And so uh, when, when uh, I get together with those guys, there, we use the ACTS acronym, a lot of you, for prayer focus. So you guys are familiar with that. Adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving, and Supplication. And so the one-to-one book that we used that we got from Men at the Cross years ago, it, it gives you a little table on each, on each lesson to fill in the blanks. What can I praise God for? What should I confess? What should I give Thanksgiving for? And what can I ask God for? And most of us are pretty comfortable with the idea of Thanksgiving because if at minimum we've said grace before a meal, Right? Right? Right, and so, well, well, so what I've encouraged, I need a little help out here, guys. So he's, he's reaching for the button. If you don't help me out, we're all in trouble. But so, um, now I distracted myself. How about that? Yeah, it happens. But so, what I'll do is I'll say, hey, you know what? I'll, I'll start off praying for the first few weeks. I'll do all the praying out loud. That's great. And, and so maybe we'll add Thanksgiving. Why don't you do Thanksgiving? I'll do adoration, confession. Those are the hardest parts. You do the Thanksgiving, and then I'll do the supplication. How can I pray for you? And then I'll do, uh, after a few more weeks, we'll say, I'll do an adoration, confession. You do the Thanksgiving and supplication. And then maybe a few weeks later, I say, I'll do the adoration. You guys do the confession, the Thanksgiving, and the supplication. And then before you know it, they're praying out loud in public with the waitress standing there waiting to take their order out loud in a public place for the first time in their entire lives praise the Lord and so that's just a a way you can kind of invest in the life of somebody like that but these two guys Wes and Matt that I've been discipling I said hey you know what I'm going to be away I couldn't do it last Thursday night can't do it this Thursday night right no I can't do it this Thursday night and I said that's two weeks off how about this we're 10 weeks into the study how about you guys do it together and they did it praise the Lord I'm not telling you that because I do anything that's all that special. I'm just trying to encourage you today because it's it's not hard. I mean, quite honestly, if I can do it, anybody can do it. But I believe firmly in my spirit that we need to be making disciples who make disciples who make disciples who make disciples until Jesus comes back again. Because I want to talk just a little bit about the Great Commission. You guys are familiar with the Great Commission from Matthew chapter 28. And most of the time that we look at Matthew chapter 28, we look at it in a linear perspective. Right? We read through that and we say, okay, there's multiple components to that. It starts with, right, go make disciples. He doesn't say come be disciples. He says go make disciples. And go, go make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We're all familiar with this, right, church? Right? And, and teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. And he says, and I'll be with you even to the end of the age. And I say, I mean, that's awesome. That's a great promise that I'll be with you even to the end of the age. But I want to suggest to you that I don't think the Great Commission is a linear promise. I think it's a circular promise. And that's why I put together the diagram that I've got here. I think what he's actually saying is, is I want you to go make disciples. Baptize them. Teach them. Then he says, I'll be with you as you make disciples and baptize them and teach them. And I'll be with you so that you can make disciples and baptize them and teach them. And so, you know, we're going to talk again in a little bit about Acts chapter 1, verse 8. We all know that, right? You will receive power when you receive the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you're going to receive power. And we think, man, that's awesome. I get power from God. Aren't I powerful? But he says there's a purpose for it so that you can be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and even to the ends of the earth. God's got purpose in the power that he gives us. And I believe that that's emblematic of what he's got for us. And so when he says, go make disciples, some of us think, well, you know, I'm, I'm still being discipled. And didn't Jesus say, hey, if you, come follow me. He said, take up your cross daily, right? And, but he said, hey, if you come follow me, I'm going to make you fishers of men. You remember that? And then fast forward three years later. He says, I want you to go preach the gospel. Go make disciples. 
you're ready. And that promise has been made for each one of us. I don't believe that the church is the place where we just go to be discipled or to disciple one another in perpetuity. I believe the church is a place where we come to get equipped to go and make disciples, to fill the, p- fulfill the commission that Jesus has given us. And so I want to thank you for your attention. And I and the church health community want to make ourselves available to you in any way that we possibly can to encourage you and even to take that baby step of one thing that might be encouraging. That's what we're here for. To help you. Not to discourage you, but to encourage you. And so, I didn't talk about everything that's in my written report, but Bishop Sizemore, that's my report. Thank you. All right, thank you.